still missing something here. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Let's adjust this a little bit. Sound check, test. All right. Good afternoon. Praise the Lord. Wow. So this is um, my sermon before I go back to the Philippines on Tuesday. Praise God. I'll be away for uh, five weeks and uh, conducting 12 seminars. It's not a holiday, I tell you. It's a back-to-back -back, uh, seminar from Mindanao to Visayas and then to Luzon. And so please, I, uh, I would covet your uh, prayers for stamina. I know it's really hot in the Philippines, 42 degrees, but uh, hopefully it's going to rain soon because it's already June. And then uh, especially for anointing, a special anointing. But praise God. Three Sundays ago, I was here and also studying God's Word with you, and we looked at the life of the prophet Isaiah, the call of the prophet Isaiah. Remember the question God asked in Isaiah 6 verse 8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Remember, Isaiah, after he was cleansed by the Lord without hesitation, Isaiah yelled out, here I am, send me. Now there's no sign of God having to beat Isaiah over the head and demand that he become a soul winner. God just asked and Isaiah responded wholeheartedly. Well, this afternoon we're going to study the opposite to Isaiah's response to God's call as we look at the life of Jonah. I hope you got your outline there with you. Now, how many of you here have actually read the book of Jonah? Not just heard the story, but actually read the book of Jonah. Can you raise your hands, please? Those who actually read, all right. Oops, less than half of the congregation has actually read the book of Jonah. So that makes my work a little harder this afternoon. The book of Jonah, of course, is a classic example in the Bible of a man who had been called by God to preach the gospel, but he refused to obey God's call. Now, if you ask people today if they know anything about Jonah, the first thing they would recall would be Jonah being swallowed by a whale. And that's probably one of the best known stories in the Bible. And so I thought of using the title for our sermon this afternoon, I'll use the title, Jaws, the Inside Story. <laughs> but just kidding, the truth of the matter is, if you study the life of Jonah, there is something about him, there is something about his mindset, his attitude, that should cause us to reflect about our own life. Because without you even knowing it, you might be infected by this mindset of Jonah. And that's why I'm calling this sermon, The Jonah Syndrome. The Jonah Syndrome. Even though this is a familiar story, my prayer is that God will give us a fresh light from this uh, account and make a difference in the way we live our, our Christian lives today. If you'll join me, please, let's all stand as we read just the first three verses of this book of Jonah. Starting with verse 1, all together now, ready, read. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which is going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we stand before you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege that we have to study your words 
And Lord, even though just less than half of the congregation has read the book, Lord, we pray that you will help us to, to discern the, the lessons, the precious lessons that you want us to learn from this book. And so Lord, right now we just ask that you remove any hindrance, any concern, any worry, any doubt, cover it with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ so that each one of us will be attentive to your spirit and as you have promised, your words will not return to you empty, but that you will accomplish, it will accomplish for which you purposed it. And so Lord, that's our prayer and that's our desire. We ask this in Jesus' name and God's people say Amen and Amen. You may take your seats. Praise God. Now I'm sure all of us will agree that as Christians, our number one responsibility is to find God's will and then to apply it to our lives. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 verse 2, we are to test and approve God's will, what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now friends, it's one thing not to know the will of God and therefore miss it, but it's a completely different thing to know the will of God and yet refuse it. The classic example in all of the Bible of a believer who knows the will of God yet doesn't want to do it, is found in the pages of the book of Jonah. Even those who have never read the book are familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale. And because of that particular story, many consider the book of Jonah to be a fairy tale, or at best, only a parable. Now what I'd like to show you is that there is evidence in other portions of the Bible that Jonah is a real character. If you compare the first verse, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Compare it with 2 Kings 14.25 in the historical section of the Old Testament. There is a definite historical reference to the same person. It says here... He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant right there, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. That means, friends, this guy Jonah lived in a village just north of Nazareth where the Lord Jesus Christ himself grew up and lived. But the best Evidence for the historicity of Jonah as a prophet is that the Lord Jesus Christ himself referred to Jonah twice in the Gospels. And in particular, the Lord Jesus Christ made the story of Jonah in the belly of the big fish as a historical reference to his own burial, death, and resurrection. We find this in Matthew chapter 12, 39 to 41. It says, He answered a wicked adulterous an adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Brothers and sisters, when you read through the book of Jonah, we're not dealing here with a fairy tale. We're not dealing with imagination. We're dealing with a real man, with a real experience with God, who learned the truth that all of us should learn. And what is the truth? You cannot, you cannot run from God. Now the book of Jonah is given in four chapters. I want to highlight a few things from each chapter. And so this will be a little longer than my usual sermon. And you know my usual sermon is about two hours. And so, the book of Jonah, again, is a classic example in the Bible of a man who knew beyond question what God wanted, to, wanted him to do. And yet, he openly and defiantly disobeyed God. And many people, when they study the book of Jonah, they are hung up with the fish. You know, when they think about this... Jonah being swallowed by a fish, they get hung up on that story. But friends, I'm here to tell you this afternoon that in actuality, this book is not about the fish. It's about a bird. <laughs> Why is that? Because the name Jonah means dove. It's a story about 
a man named Dove. Let's look at one chapter at a time. Chapter 1, we see the pitiful Jonah running from God. Chapter 1 is about rebellion. Here, Jonah is running away from the will of God. There is no question what God wanted Jonah to do. In the first verse, a chapter, the first chapter, second verse, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, or preach against it, for they, their wickedness has come up before me. Here was God's specific plan for Jonah. You see, friends, one thing you'll find in the Bible is that God has a, spe a specific person for a specific situation. Believe me when I say to you, God has a specific plan for you. Never, never entertain the thought that you are useless in the kingdom of God. God has a specific plan for you. You just have to discern it, to discover it, and then deploy it. But Jonah was given the task to go to Nineveh and preach. Now the city of Nineveh is a very wicked city. This was the capital city of the Assyrians. The land of the Assyrians is where you have modern Iraq today. The Ninevites were known for their cruelty and brutality when they conquer a nation. When they captured people, it has been recorded that they would pull off their lips. They would pull off their hands. And there are times recorded in history that they would strip the skin off while they were still alive and they would hang the skins on the wall. And at other times, they would impale a person and then expose him to the burning sun until he dies. Sometimes the height of their cruelty when they would take little children and burn them in front of their doomed parents. So vicious were the, the, were the Ninevites that sometimes when cities heard of the approach of the Assyrian army, you know what the whole city would do? They would commit mass suicide. They would rather die than wait for the Assyrians to conquer the land and experience their brutality. The Assyrians were the Nazis of their day. They were cruel, they were wicked, they were inhuman. And Jonah, being a Hebrew prophet, is well aware that God had predicted in the scriptures that the Ninevites will one day bring so much harm to God's people. And so when God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, you know, this must have stunned Jonah greatly. Because Jonah knew the kind of people the Ninevites were. So here was a direct will of God, a direct plan of God, God wanted Jonah to do. But Jonah didn't want to do it. Why? He didn't want to do it, not because he was afraid of the Ninevites, that they might go against him, that they might capture him, that they might torture him, that he might die preaching. That's not the reason why Jonah didn't want to preach. The reason he didn't want to preach to the Ninevites is that they might actually repent. Is that they might actually accept the message, and because of the repentance, God would forgive them, and when God forgives them, then God will not punish them. And that's what Jonah doesn't want to happen. He wants punishment on these people. And so we find here in the first sentence of verse 3, it says, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. So John, God said to Jonah, you go to Nineveh. That was northeast of where Jonah was. And here is Jonah getting on a boat. Goes west to Tarshish, 2,000 miles to the southern portion of Spain. The opposite direction of where God wants him to go. You know, sometimes this is our experience, isn't it? You know, sometimes we know what God wants us to do and we don't do it. We don't like it. Sometimes God says, I want you to stop doing that and we don't want to. And we stay away from God. We don't attend church. We don't attend the care group. We miss on these activities because, you know, we'll be convicted if we attend and so we try to run away from the Lord as far as possible as we can. And so Jonah knew that he couldn't really 
escaped the presence of the Lord. He knew the principle of Psalm 139, which says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I made my bed in Sheol, that's the place of the dead, behold, you are there. And so when it says that Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord, it meant that Jonah was resigning from his prophetic responsibility. What it means is that Jonah was handing his resignation letters. Jonah is saying, I quit. I don't want this job anymore. And the last verse of, the last half of verse 3, it says there, So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish. Now, did you notice, those of you who read the book, that the moment Jonah decided to go away from the Lord, it's all the way down for him. You notice it here? He went down to Joppa. And then in verse 5, it says, He had gone down to the, the, the lowest parts of the ship. He had lain down and was fast asleep. In chapter 2, verse 6, it says that, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. You see, friends, it's always going down when we decide to go away from the will of God. Brothers and sisters, every time you make up your mind to disobey the will of God, you are setting yourself to a, downway, a downward path. You're going down. And Jonah here went to Joppa, which was seacoast town of that day. Those who visited Israel, we went there. Joppa, that's that that a suburb south of uh, Tel Aviv. And then it says there that Jonah found a ship going to Tarshish. Now this is rather unusual that Jonah conveniently at the moment he reached Joppa found a ship. Because you see, it wasn't that there's a ship every day that going from Joppa to, that, to Tarshish. Unlike, you know, you go to Pearson Airport and you want to go to Cuba, there are five flights in a day going to Cuba. But at that time, going to Tarshish, it's good if there's once a month trip to Tarshish. But you know, it's so convenient for him to go away from the Lord, isn't it? Friends, you have here the first Jonah syndrome. The Jonah syndrome that we have here is just because the circumstances are working out in your life doesn't mean necessarily that you are doing the will of God. See, Jonah made up his mind that he was going to resist the will of God. And you know what Satan did? He made it so convenient for him to stay away from God. Friends, sometimes circumstances can indicate that we are doing the will of God. You know, some circumstances can line up to the word of God and gives us confidence that we are doing the will of God. But friends, sometimes when you're going against the will of God, circumstances will also line up. Satan will make it easy for you to stay away from God. And so friends, he went down there, he found a ship going to Tarshish. If there's a student here who wants to quit school, Satan will give you a transportation to stay away from school. If there's a husband here who wants to leave his wife, you can find a ship. Satan will provide you a ship. If there are Christian here who doesn't want to serve the Lord, you can always find good excuse not to serve the Lord. You know, sometimes churches are not involved in soul winning, and you can be involved in a lot of ships, of church programs, and activities making you all busy. So many activity, but no productivity. No conversions, no baptisms, no new members, but lots of activities. But because you see, Satan will provide us with those ships just to stay away from the will of God. And then it says at the end of verse 3, after paying the fare. You know, the Bible says that Jonah paid the fare. You know, that's always the, the thing with sin, my friends. You always end up paying the fare. When you get out of the will of God, when you get sin in your life, you always pay the fare. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Friends, 
when you stay out of the will of God, you will find yourselves paying the fare. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will teach you more than you want to know. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Here's the Jonas syndrome. You'll always pay the fare when you run from God and get out of His will. There are backslidden fathers and mothers who decided they would stop coming to church and they're paying the fare in rebellious children. There are Christians who decided they could get themselves involved in a non-Christian relationship and they are paying the fare of unwanted pregnancy. There are backslidden Christians who decided they would start visiting pornographic websites and they're paying the fare of addiction and polluted mind. You always end up paying the fare. But I have some good news for you, friends. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ went to that place called Calvary. And on Calvary's cross, Jesus Christ paid the fare for our sin. Brothers and sisters, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Aren't you glad Jesus paid the fare for us? But now what I want you to note here is that here is a pitiful prophet who is fleeing from the will of God. But you know what? God was involved in the matter. Look at verse 4. It says there, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. My friend, if you are a child of God, if you know the Lord, and you decide that you're going to defy the will of God, then you decide that you're going to disobey God, then friends, I have something to tell you. The Lord is going to stir up a storm in your life somewhere down the road. Jonah got on that boat. It looked like it will be a smooth sailing. And then suddenly the wind began to pick up. All of a sudden, dark clouds began to gather. The Bible says the Lord hurled out a storm of wind on that sea. You see, there are different kinds of storms that you read in the Bible. Sometimes a storm is given by Satan. Satan himself will cause a storm. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he rebuked that storm on the Sea of Galilee, that was a satanic storm. But friends, from this story, we can also see that God can sometimes be the source of that storm. You see, when you're disobeying God and you're a child of God, God can cause a storm in your life. Don't rebuke that storm. It's coming from God, not from Satan. What you need to do is to listen to God and try to see what He's teaching you. Brothers and sisters, when you decide to get away from the Lord, it's going to be a stormy weather in your life. And so here's the Lord, he stirred up a mighty tempest in the sea. And then verse 5, it says there, the sailors became afraid. Now friends, take note that these are experienced seamen. They've been through a lot of storms. And so when sailors get afraid, you know you're in real trouble. You know that this is life and death situation. Because the sailors themselves we're so afraid. And then notice verse 5. The end it says, But Jonah had gone below into the hold of that ship, laying down and fallen asleep. Can you imagine this? There was a great storm outside. The men on the top of that boat were so panicky and they were praying to their gods. And there's the child of God sleeping at the bottom of that ship. So the captain of the boat goes down there where he wakes Jonah up and he said what do you mean sleeper arise call on your God perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish in other words he's rebuking Jonah and saying to him this is no time to sleep it is now time to pray is it rather sad brothers and sisters that there's a storm that's going on and the people who knew God are indifferent to it that the people who had a relationship with God are sleeping when all the world 
They're praying to the wrong gods. It's a sad picture, brothers and sisters. When the people of God are spiritually indifferent to this culture where, where we are in, that is disturbed by a tempest, tempestuous problem, it's a sad picture when the Christians themselves, the churches, are sleeping in a storm. Friends, I believe this is a picture of what's happening in Canada today. The Canadian cult culture is going through a storm and we Christians are just sleeping. We're indifferent to the problems we're facing. Jonah realized that he was the problem. Now they came up with a plan to avoid this disaster. We read in verses 7 to 9, it says, But each man said to his mate, Come, let us, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And then verse 9, He said to them, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Friends, it's a sad thing when the lost world has to ask a Christian if he's indeed a believer. That's a sad thing. The Jonah syndrome here that we can see, friends, it's sad, it's a sad world when people have so compromised their testimony that lost people had to ask if they are a Christian. Do people around you know that you're saved? Over at that school where you study, do your classmates know that you're a Christian? Over that workplace, do they know that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? It's sad when people have so compromised that the people around them do not realize that they are Christians. In fact, when they learn that you attend Champion Life, they are shocked. Really? You attend Champion Life? And they cannot believe it. It becomes a real challenge to witness or invite them to a program that we have here in church. Because they will ask you, what's the difference? You say the F word, I say the F word. You laugh at dirty jokes, I laugh at dirty jokes. You gossip, I gossip. You cheat on your income tax, I cheat on my income tax. You visit pornographic websites, I visit pornographic websites. Tell me the difference. What difference does it make that I go to your church? It's sad when the world has to wonder, are you a real, a real Christian? Verse 12, finally, it was Jonah who offered the solution. He said, pick me up. And throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. So that means Jonah knew who the problem was. And he knew what the solution is. Again, I think this is a, a, a perfect picture of the world that we have today. You see friends, the world is having a storm. And it's so easy to pick up at some sectors in our society and blame them for the problems we're having in Canada. You know, you can blame the atheists and say that they are what is wrong in this country. You can blame the alcohol industry and say that this is what is wrong in our country. And of course, the favorite scapegoat are the politicians. You know, it's the politicians. That is what is wrong in this country. Really? You blame the politicians? You didn't even vote last Thursday. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I really believe that the main problem in Canada today is not to be found anywhere else. It's to be found among those who name the name of the Lord. It's found in the churches. That's where the problem is. Where you have churches who are indifferent where you have churches that are cold, 
when you have churches who are uninvolved. You know, it's summertime. It's sad, but it's true. There are churches in Canada that will close on summertime. Did you know that? They close up on summertime because there's no people there. People are going to their cottages. I mean, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not against having a holiday. We have three months of winter. We need to maximize our summer. But you see, the problem here is the mindset. It's the attitude. Where the church is just a... Is, you know, it's not really that important. We're winning people. It's not really that important. And so friends, I think this is a perfect picture of the situation we are in today. And so those men, they tried to not agree with Jonah. Jonah said, pick me up and throw me. And you know those men, they have a sense of decency to avoid that. They tried everything they can. They threw all the, the luggages. They threw everything just to make it float and so that they won't have to go down without throwing Jonah in overboard. You know, it's sad when the world has a better conscience than the Christian. Isn't that sad? When you left your wallet at Tim Hortons and the following day it's still there, but you leave your wallet at church and it's gone? I mean, isn't that sad? When the world has a better sense of decency than Christians? So they threw Jonah overboard. They cannot handle it anymore. The, the, the situation was just impossible. Because it was divine. This is what God wants to happen. And so now we find in verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now verse 17 is the center of the controversy of the book of Jonah. It says that the Lord had prepared a great fish. You know, people, they, they laugh at this. You know, is it possible? Isn't this, is this crazy? I mean, look at this. It's ridiculous that a, a big fish would swallow a man. Actually, a big fish can swallow a man. It's not ridiculous. It can actually happen. But the world is reacting to this. And they say, this is, this is fairy tale. And the King James Version is not helping because the King James Version actually used the word whale. But the Hebrew word was not whale, it was just a big fish. And so we need to settle this in our minds. And friends, the way to settle this in our minds is this. Do you really believe that God has enough power to do what He said He, he did? Can you actually believe that God can command a fish to swallow a man? That's the issue. It's not the thing that, you know, that a fish can swallow a man. That the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Do you believe that? You know what, friends? There is a record, actual record of experiences of people being swallowed by sea creatures. Here's a newspaper article from February 1891 by a man named James Bartley of the shores of the Falkland Islands who fell overboard and was actually swallowed by a sperm whale. When they found him, he was in a delirium for more than two weeks. But then on the third week, he survived to tell the story. So here's what the newspaper report says. The newspaper report, it says there, a whale was captured and killed after a great battle near the Falkland Islands. During the fight, one of the seamen disappeared. The crew worked all day removing the bladder. They still didn't know that he was swallowed by the whale. So the crew worked all day removing the bladder. The next morning, the sailors were startled by something in the stomach that gave signs of life and discovered James Bartley doubled up and unconscious. He was in the whale's belly for 36 hours. His flesh was bleached by gastric juices to a deadly whiteness and became like parchment. Bartley said he, has, he lost consciousness but would probably have lived in the, stomachs, in the whale's stomach until he starved 
for he did not lack air. That means he could breathe inside. The heat was terrific, but he said he could breathe. Now friends, that's a man who actually survived being the belly of this big fish, if you may call it. For 36 hours, he was in the whale's belly. But now the difficulty, of course, is in this account, Jonah was in the belly for how long? Three days and three nights. How can a man survive three days and three nights in the belly of a big fish? Well, how about if you just believe what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said? The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You know what Jesus Christ did here? He just made a comparison between the account of Jonah and what will happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now for the comparison to be equal and balanced, here's what needs to happen. You have Jonah and Jesus. First is the location. One is in the belly of the big fish. The other is in the heart of the earth. That's balanced. Alright, you have it there. And next is the duration. You have three days and three nights. Three days. That's balanced. That's the comparison. And then... What was their situation? The situation was the condition. Jesus Christ was dead for three days. That means Jonah was also dead for three days and three nights for the comparison to be balanced. And then the action that happened, Jonah was resuscitated back to life while Jesus was resurrected back to life. And that's why you can find in Jonah chapter 2 verse 2, the prayer of Jonah. He said, I called out of my distress to the Lord and He answered me. I cried for help from the what? The depth of Sheol. You see the word Sheol there is the Hebrew place for the place of the dead. That it's possible that Jonah actually died in the belly of that big fish. But after three days and three nights, God resuscitated him back to life. Now friends, I don't want to mess up the storytelling of our Sunday school teachers. I don't want to be dogmatic about this. Because you see friends, whether Jonah was dead or alive inside the belly of the big fish, is beside the point. That's not the point. The point is, it was God who appointed for this incident to happen. It was God who commanded the fish to swallow him. It was God who allowed him to stay there for three days and three nights. And if he was alive, God has all the power to give him life in that belly for three days and three nights. If he was dead, God has the power to resuscitate him back to life. So friends, the real issue here is do you believe in that God who has the power to command a big fish? And a man to stay alive for three days and three nights or dead for three days and three nights and resuscitated back to life. Chapter 2, we find now the praying Jonah running to God and here it's about the rescue. Jonah calls out to God for deliverance and when you read the whole of chapter 2, I don't have time to read this, you'll find here a prayer of a grateful man for God's deliverance. He was praising God and thanking God for delivering him. But then, notice here in verse 3, he said, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, all your billows and your waves passed over me. Did you notice something here in verse 3? The personal pronoun? You cast me into the deep. Your billows, your waves passed over me. You know what Jonah realized here? He realized that it was not the sailors who threw him overboard. It was actually God. You cast me into the deep. You see friends, Jonah saw the hand of God in his situation. Try to think about it. Do you see the hand of God in your situation? Even though you lost your job, do you really think God has a hand in it? You're having this health problem. Do you think it's possible that God has a hand in it? You're having this emotional problem. Do you think that God has a hand in it? Because God has a, has a message to give to you. And so friends, we need to realize here that God is involved in our situation. You need to see the hand of God at work. And then verse 4, we notice what Jonah said 
I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. You see here, Jonah made the discovery that all of us need to make. And friends, this is a Jonah syndrome. And that is, being away from the Lord is never as fun as we might think it is. Being away from the Lord is never as fun as we might think it is. You know, the devil is really smart. You know, sometimes the devil would whisper to your ear, the inner ear, and he would say, well now, you know, you've been serving God, doing all the sacrifices, you've been depriving yourself of the fun your friends are having. Come on, why not backslide a little? Why not go away from it all? Why not stop doing anything spiritual? You're too spiritual. Give yourself a break. Come on, give in to your lust of the flesh. Why not enjoy that lust of the eyes? Why not feel good about your pride of life? Chill out! You only live once. Life is short. Have an affair. Have you heard those lies? Those whisperings? Because you know what Satan is promising is that if you just get out of the worship team for a while, just get out of the ministry for a while, and just enjoy your life in the world, that you will really enjoy life away from God. Friends, that's the lie of the enemy. Jonah learned that the hard, the hard way, that it is not as nearly as fun, uh, it's, not near, it's not nearly as fun to be away from the Lord as the devil would have you believe. Friends, people who are not living for Jesus are not as happy as you would imagine them to be. Sometimes you watch these people, you know, in the talk shows, and they're being interviewed and they have their old smiles they've been married for four or five times already and they feel like they're in control of life and they have so much money to spend and they're just enjoying it but friends you know what what you do not see is that behind the door what you don't see are those times when they're alone when when the misery of their disobedience and wandering from God is gripping their hearts this past week alone, we have two celebrities who are rich and famous, found in their bedroom, committed suicide. One is a fashion designer, and the other is a TV host. Friends, Jonah made that discovery. It's not as fun as it seemed to be to stay away from the Lord. That's the Jonah syndrome. So now he turns to the Lord, and he says to the Lord... I will look toward, again, toward your holy temple. You know the Jews, when they pray, they always pray toward Jerusalem. You know, the, the Muslims, 600 AD plus, just copied that from the Jews. But it's the original, the Jews. That's how they pray. They pray toward their holy temple. And what that tells us is that Jonah is now willing to go back to God. Jonah is willing to repent of his sin. This verse is equivalent to 1 John 1, 9 in the New Testament that says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a symbolic act on his part that he was returning to the Lord. You see, Jonah was being disciplined by God. And because he's a child of God, he received that discipline. You know, I have my children, when they were growing up, we had to discipline them. You can ask Josiah how much discipline he got from me. I discipline my own children. Sometimes I'm tempted to discipline other children. You know, when you're in the mall, or when you're in the airplane, and this kid is just running and crazy around, you know, crying and everything. And sometimes I want to discipline other's children. But friends, that's not my position to, to, uh, to do. God will only discipline his own children. And so here's the thing, friends. Listen to this. Very important principle now. If you're walking in sin, and everything seems to be normal, you don't find guilt, you can sleep well, in fact, you're prospering, you just got a promotion, everything's going well, and you're walking in sin. 
What does that mean? Maybe it means you're not a child of God. That's why God is not disciplining you. You're not a Christian after all. We have to be very afraid when you walk in sin and you're not bothered at all. You need to be afraid. Because that could mean you're practicing churchianity, not Christianity. Yes, you attend church. Yes, you enjoy the fun that we have here. You'll enjoy the snacks later on. (laughs) But friends, what is more important than this is being sure that you are a child of God. And so it happens, chapter 2 verse 10, it says, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah unto dry land. Can you imagine what Jonah would have looked like? Being vomited by a fish into dry land? I'm sure the gastric juices must have taken most of his hair out. Those gastric juices must have burned his skin, bleached his skin white. And so can you imagine Jonah with his, you know, tattered clothing, his hair almost gone, and then his bleached white and he goes into the city of Nineveh crying, Nineveh will fall. No wonder people repented. They saw a man from hell. <laughs> I mean, if you see this kind of person declaring the judgment of God, you have to believe this man. It looks like he came from the pit of hell. But brothers and sisters, what we find here is that John obeying God, listen to this brother, listen to this sister, when you get disciplined by God, you will be ready to do the will of God. The third chapter we find here, the preaching Jonah entering the city of Nineveh. This chapter is about repentance. Chapter 3 verse 1 opens up with these words, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Oh, I love that. Do you see the word? The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. You know, some people have the idea that God's will is so rigid that if you don't get it the first time, you'll miss it for the rest of your life. That somehow it's all over, that somehow you don't have to try anymore because you've missed the first time, you'll never get it back. No more second serving. But friends, that's not what God said to Jonah. God said to Jonah, the second time, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad that we have a God of the second chance? I mean, friends, if not for the second chance, you won't have a preacher here this afternoon. The only reason I'm here is because God is the God of the second chance. But that's okay. If you won't have a preacher here, because if God is not the God of the second chance, you won't be here anyway. There's no congregation to preach to. This room will be empty if God is not the God of the second chance. Remember Mark, the nephew of Barnabas? And they were on this first missionary journey and Paul tagged along this uh, guy Mark. But then while they were doing their preaching circuit, Mark missed his mom. He went back to mama in Jerusalem and left Paul and Barnabas. And so the second missionary, when they were planning their trip, Barnabas said, let's take my nephew again, Mark. And Paul said, no way! He abandoned us, remember? During the first trip. And they were arguing back and forth. And it ended up that Barnabas and Paul separated ways. Barnabas took with him Mark, and the apostle Paul took with him another disciple. But then what is so interesting is that towards the end of Paul's life, the apostle Paul wrote in Second. Timothy 4.11, he said, Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. You see, Mark got a second chance. Friends, there are people here who failed you. They made the wrong decision. They blew it. But don't make the judgment that they can never be used by God again. Because God is the God of the second chance. If they truly repent and work their way back to God, God can use them again. 
So the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. And Jonah was ready to obey. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And then there's a description of the city here in verse 3. It says, Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Now what does that mean? That means if you start from the gate up to the exit gate, it will take three days. Now the average distance of walking one day is 32 kilometers. So if it's 32 kilometers and it's three days, that's 96 kilometers from the opening gate to the closing gate. 96 kilometers radius or diameter rather. And so friends, this has caused some people to doubt, you know, this is a huge city. I mean, what kind of city is this? I mean, 96 kilometers is like driving from, from the Scarborough Town Center up to Cambridge. That's the distance, 96 kilometers. But you know what? Archaeologists, they found something. When they traced the city, they were able to look at the, uh, the boundaries of the city. And then they found out that the city, Nineveh, was actually a complex of cities. A complex of cities. You know, it's like Toronto proper, and there is the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. Some people live in Brampton, some people live in Mississauga, some people live in Scarborough, but they all are part of the GTA. And so when it says an exceedingly huge city, it's the GNA. It's the Greater Nineveh Area. It's a complex of cities. And so here is Jonah going to Nineveh. And his sermon was very simple. It's just eight words. And these eight words can be preached in three seconds. And Jonah has these three words to preach. Yet, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Just eight words. Three seconds message. Now I know people will love this message. You know, just three seconds. Who's the preacher next Sunday? Pastor Roy? Oh no, Pastor Roy again. It's too long. It's too long. You know, some people don't like my sermons because it's too long. You know, I feel sad about that. When a pastor goes over time, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, they feel bad about it. They began complaining, grumbling in their hearts. And yet, when they're watching basketball and there's overtime, they're jumping for joy. You know? <laughs> I mean, you can watch a movie for two hours, two hours inside the theater, and you're just in church, just listening to a sermon for an hour, and yet you complain. Friends, there's a Jonah uh, problem here again that we're seeing. And so here, 40 days and Nineveh shall be over, will be destroyed. Just one sermon, one man. It's a sermon about wrath, not about love. It's a sermon about judgment, not salvation. It's a sermon about condemnation, not deliverance. You see, this pulpit, you will not hear only the love of God. That's good. We hear about the love of God from this pulpit, but you will also hear about the wrath of God. That's the balance. God is love, but God is holy. And because He is holy, He's against sin. And so what happened here in verse 5, it says there, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Wow! Talk about a citywide repentance, revival. And then the six verses, then the word came to the White House. It came to the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Wow, friends, you know what the king did? He got right down on his knees, and he begged God for forgiveness. Can you imagine a citywide repentance? From the city hall down to the lowest, uh, the farthest county. Everybody seeking repentance and seeking God's forgiveness. And verse 10 says, Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that He had said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. Friends, God, our God, is a loving God. 
A lot of people are making a false dichotomy. They say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament because the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, but the God of the New Testament is a loving God. That's not true. It's the same God that we worship, both in the Old and the New Testament. He's a loving God, but He's also angry with sin, both in the Old and the New Testament. And the Lord Jesus Christ compared what happened during Jonah's time and he, in his time in Matthew 12, 41, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment. That means the generation at Jonah's time and the generation at Jesus' time. They will stand up. And the, the generation at Jonah's time will condemn these people in the Jesus' time because during Jonah's time, they repented through the preaching of a reluctant prophet. But here, during Jesus' time, they did not repent at the preaching of the Redeemer Himself. And so they will be condemned. And then chapter 4, finally, the pouting Jonah is running against God. And this one, chapter 4, is about resentment. Now here is a preacher who is called by God to preach the message of repentance. Faithfully, he delivered his message. And the response was earth-shaking, unheard of, that a whole city has been converted. Now you would think that because of this revival, Jonah would be shouting hallelujah. You would think that Jonah would be engaged in follow-up programs and, you know, a lot of uh, ministries to follow up these young converts. You would think that he would be absolutely ecstatic with joy. But you know what you find? It says here in verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Wow! Can you believe this? Have you ever seen this in your life? Somebody came to the Lord, repented of his sin, and this person is angry? Because this person, this other person, came to God? Unbelievable. And then in verse 2 it says there, So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was, this, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarsus, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. And you know what Jonah was doing then? He was pouting. He was saying to himself, I knew it, I knew it. I was afraid this will happen. I was afraid that if I go there and preach and these people will repent and then God will forgive them and then God will spare them from the punishment they deserve. And so Jonah was, living, was having a little pouting party. And in verse 3 it says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Can you imagine the animosity in the heart of this man? And the Lord had to ask him a question in verse 4. Is it right for you to be angry? God had to ask Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? And you know what Jonah did in verse 5? He sits on the east side of the city under the shade of a tree or, or, or a plant. And that he was just watching the city and he was still hoping that, the, that God will destroy the city with fire. He was still hoping that God would just destroy the city. And then verse 6 said, And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. See, he enjoyed the shade, he enjoyed the comfort that this plant provided. And you know what happened the following day, verse 7? It says there, But as morning dawned, and the next day God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And then verse 8 says, And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a, a vehement uh, east wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head. That was already hairless. He was already bald. So that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. You see here, God prepared a plant, God prepared a worm, God prepared a wind. Have you noticed something here in the book of Job? Those of you who have read the book, everything was obeying God. The wind in chapter 1 was obeying God. The storm in chapter 1 was obeying God. Even the dice, when they throw the lots, 
The dice was obeying God. The big fish was obeying God. And then here's the plant that is obeying God. And then the worm was obeying God. And then the east wind was obeying God. Only one is not obeying God in the book of Jonah. And that is Jonah. <laughs> now isn't that sad? That all of nature obeys the Lord. And the man who has more to, to, to obey God for and to love God for is not obeying God. It's sad that we people need to appreciate more what God has done. And yet, we are rebelling against God. And so verse 9 says, Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And then finally, verse 10 and verse 11, God closed this book with a question. God said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, not nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in a night. Verse 11, And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. You know what God is asking here, friends? He's asking you this question. And here's the last Jonah syndrome we can find here. It's sad, but it's true that there are people who are more concerned with their plants and with their pets than with people. More interested in material than spiritual things. Friends, do you have that attitude where you can be more concerned with your plants? I know it's summertime, you know, where we have to grow those flowers and we have to enjoy the color because when it's winter, it's all white again. I have nothing against that. My wife is so busy planting, you know, even just a few weeks after the operation. That's okay. We enjoy the plants. I love tulips. But friends, the question that God is raising here, is it possible sometimes that we are more concerned with plants than with people? Is it possible that you can be more concerned with your pets than with people? That we are more interested in having things than helping people? Is that possible? Friends, we need to remember that there are, that there are people who are lost out there and without us telling them the good news they will be lost forever and that's why friends we need to realize here that people they need the Lord people need the Lord this is a reminder for us here at Champion Life you know we come to church and sometimes you see the same people same faces week after week what happened? that means nobody shared the gospel with anyone? Nobody invited a soul that is still lost to come to church? What's happening? No conversions, no baptisms, no, no, no new members. Friends, this is not what the church is all about. The church is about winning the lost. If we're not winning the lost, we don't deserve to come together as a church. That's the call God has for Jonah. And that's the call God had for Isaiah. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Jonah said, no way. <laughs> Friends, the Jonah syndrome. In response to this sermon, we have a, I think we have a video clip. We have a video clip? Or we're singing. Let me call on the worship team to come. At uh, Brampton, we just have the video of uh, People Need the Lord. But this time we'll be singing. That's good. I'd like you to uh, look at these lyrics very carefully. People Need the Lord. And we need to reflect, friends. We need to uh, look at our hearts. This Jonah syndrome. Is it possible that you're infected with this? Do we have Christians here who are out of the will of God? They're pouting, they're criticizing this and criticizing that. Nothing suits you. I'm going to tell you, friend, God can stir up a storm in your life and God will eat up all your material things and your comfort, comfortable things to get you back to where you ought to be. You see, God knows if you're running toward Tarshish. 
You may fool your friends, you may fool your parents, you may fool your pastor, you may fool your church mates, but you can never fool God. God knows if you're on your way to Tarshish. And so let's listen to this prayer, or to this song, and then we will respond. And just asking God to convict our hearts of anything that we need to.